All right, well, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Looks like we've got uh, six or seven folks in the room. So, um, you know, Dr. Eilet asked me to, to, to talk a little bit about, um, I guess, graduate school and maybe the, the, the choices or the process that I went through to get to graduate school and also to give you some background on consulting and engineering primarily or to answer questions. And I guess that's really what I'd like to do is, is have a pretty open conversation with you all. Um, I can certainly talk about um, the processes and experiences that I've had a little bit, but I would certainly encourage you to ask questions of me. So I'm gonna give just a quick overview. So I've got about 35 years of experience. Um, almost all of that has been on the consulting side. I've worked with several different consulting firms. Started my career in, in I'm from Nebraska originally, but I started my career in San Francisco working for a consulting firm and then moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico and eventually made it back to Nebraska. And along the way, I, I was a city traffic engineer in Olathe, Kansas, which is a, a suburb of the Kansas City metro area. Um, that was a pretty calculated, I guess, job move on my part in terms of what I wanted to accomplish. I ended up not staying there very long for, for some other reasons. Um, and then have, have been with the consulting on the consulting side ever since then. So I guess in terms of my, my graduate school experience, when I got out of school or when I got my bachelor's degree in 86, um, I'm not sure I had a real good idea of what the, you know, what a real job would look like. I don't think the intern opportunities back then were, were nearly like they are today. I mean, my company employs probably at any given time, 20 or 30 interns in various disciplines, transportation, water resources, um, utilities, drainage, all kinds of different, different sub-disciplines of civil engineering. And when I was in school, um, I, I didn't see many of those opportunities existed. I had a survey and internship one summer. And other than that, I didn't have a real good idea of what, uh, you know, what a civil engineer would really do out in the working world. So it was really probably by virtue more of a professor that you know took a real interest in me um, and offered me an assistantship in transportation that allowed me to, to stick around for a couple of years and, and get my master's degree with a traffic engineering focus. And so, um, and I had, a, I had a very keen interest in traffic um, as an undergraduate. It was one of the, the two or three disciplines probably along with water resources and structures that I, I really enjoyed. Um, but I still really didn't have a, a very clear career path. And, and I would say jobs were also a lot different um, back then, at least in Nebraska. There were, there were not a lot of consulting jobs doing traffic engineering. Um, and I don't know really what to attribute that to other than just maybe we didn't have the big, huge population centers like the, you know, the East and West Coasts and, and some of the larger cities did. So I don't think it was, it was really a very... Uh, mature profession, it seemed like at the time to me. So moving away was, was the course of action that, that made the most sense. Um, so anyway, that's a little bit of background on, on me. Um, so of the, of the folks in the room, how many of you have a, a, a clear path to what you want to do next? Have you decided whether you want to go um, into graduate school or want to enter the workforce or what kind of questions do you have relative to making those decisions? Well, I definitely know, uh, this is Kiana, uh, I'm civil engineer and junior at Tennessee State University. I definitely know that I want to pursue my master's because uh, one day I do want to get my doctorate. Um, and I do know that I want to work in transportation, but as far as my set career choice, um, I am not 100% sure. I just do know that I want to pursue um, a master's and um, further my education. What are some of the reasons that have kind of led you to, to make that decision at this point in time? Well, most definitely this conference. Um, they've given us like a lot of reasons why grad school would be a good option, just even just for the experience of just researching and, and networking when you get to grad school. And, um, and I know that even if I go, I will be okay with fellowships, and, uh, with money and financial responsibilities because I know that I'll mm -hmm. be able to find financial support. And um, yeah, that's, this conference was, is one of the main reasons why I've chosen that decision because I originally wanted to go into industry. Mm -hmm. How about others on the call? Where are you all at in your decision-making process? Anybody else wanna share where you're at? 
I'm Charles. I'm Charles Raleigh from um, UMES, University of Maryland, Eastern Shore. Um, actually, I I am not in the civil engineering um, area, but I'm with the electrical engineering, and um, I am looking forward to get into the grad school and specializing in uh, signal processing engineering and. Um, it's it's uh, has been uh, a journey, but um, this conference has really helped me a lot in confirming my decision on that. Because I was going to like get um, a work work for some time before I get into grad school, but through this conference, I've learned a lot, and it would rather help me if I just continue right from. Um, the undergrad into the grad um, school. So this has really been of help to me. Good, good, good to hear. You know, I, I queried about, oh, I, I queried about in my company, not my company, but the company I work for, there's probably, oh, I don't even know, there's probably 30 or 40 people that have advanced degrees of some sort. And I, I sort of queried a, a, a subset of those that were more on the, um, transportation and, and civil engineering side of things. And I, I got a wide range of answers and they, 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 I would say they paralleled the decision-making process that I went through quite a bit. And, um, you know, number one, I think it, it gave people an added technical advantage, the graduate school experience. Um, and, and most people had some sort of, you know, a research angle to their graduate school experience. They wrote a thesis, they did research, they supported some 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 sort of technical projects that were going on that their professors were were working on or had funding for, and and I think while it's not a perfect parallel to the consulting industry, it certainly um, gave a very good um, idea of what it would be like out in the working world in terms of doing technical analyses, interacting with with other colleagues, whether it was a client base or whether it was working with others within the uh, you know the university. Um, research um, arm gave a lot of opportunity, I believe, for um, honing and, and polishing up communication skills, both writing and public presentations, which I found to be a huge asset to, to my career. And I know everybody kind of has their own, um, you know, there are a lot of different career paths, but communications is, there's, there's, there's no way to understate how important that is in terms of your ability to progress your career, I don't think. And, and for the most part, I, I think everybody saw benefit in their, in their decision to pursue an advanced degree or in some cases, several advanced degrees. I would say certainly monetary reasons was not the, the key factor at all for most of them. And there, there are, you know, there is, I would say you'd get, you'd probably get differing opinions as to whether the, the decision to pursue an advanced degree is going to allow you to make a lot more money. Um, I think at the end of the day, you know, everybody's career has to stand on its own merit. And, you know, you, the work you put in, you'll be rewarded for. And, you know, there's people that don't have advanced degrees that obviously have excelled in the world. There's people that don't have degrees at all that have excelled in the world. And there's a lot of people that would say that their advanced degree has helped them to excel in the world. So I think it all really boils down to the work that you put into it. Um, but it's interesting to hear um, the, the stories that you've shared in terms of your decision-making process. Are there other questions or things that others would like to share, I, I guess, regarding either the, the graduate school decision making process or what is the working world like? What, you know, I could talk a lot about what my experiences have been. I don't want to bore you with what I think I should talk about. I'd rather answer questions about what you'd like to hear me talk about. Um, can you speak about, uh, my name is Paige Hines. Uh, I go to Purdue a &M University. I'm a civil engineer. And um, I was wondering, could you, uh, Talk a bit more about how um, I know you said you you asked some of your colleagues, and I know you're saying you have a master's degree as well. How do you how do you um, like really feel that kind of set you apart or uh, prepared you for industry? And um, did you go right into getting your uh, your advanced degree, or did you work first? I went into getting my advanced degree immediately after my bachelor's degree, so I did not go to work. Um, and I think the way it helped me the most was, A, it, it really exposed me to what the, 
the working world would be like. So I, I think most of the research work that I was doing, so for example, my thesis was on safety effects of, of left turns of, of elderly drivers. And it was a research project that, you know, that my professor had already secured funding for. But in doing that work, I did a lot of data collection. I did a lot of crash analysis. I did a lot of analysis of roadside safety features like um, you know, guardrail, rumble strip, strips, things of that nature, the grades, of course. Um, and I had a lot of interaction both with my peers working within the university, as well as the Nebraska Department of Transportation, which was the funding agency. So it was very much like a consulting position. I didn't know it at the time, but when I look back on it, it was very much like projects that I've worked on over the course of my career. And, and I think it really it, it opened my eyes up to see what the, the working world would be like, because honestly, before that, I didn't really have a good feel at all for what it would be like if I, if I took a position. And obviously when I went through the interview process at the conclusion of my master's degree, I got a much better idea of what those positions would look like, but I didn't interview at all at the end of my bachelor's degree because I had already made the decision I was going to go into getting my master's. And, and again, I think the communication skills and sort of just the confidence that I was able to bring to my position when I did take it, um, helped me a lot in terms of writing reports and presenting the results of reports. And really just the, I would say the critical thinking and just the technical analysis process that you go through. I think when you do a lot of, uh, you know, homework assignments and things that you do to get your degree, you don't, you don't necessarily get the feel for what that's really like in the working world. And those are the areas that I think it really helped me the most with. Other questions? Thank you, very much. you bet. Well, I'll talk a little bit more about one of the one of the decision points that I made after I'd been in the consulting industry for about six or seven years, um, both in uh, in California and, and New Mexico. And you know, the work that I did as a traffic engineer, and so I've I actually manage a road. I manage a transportation group now that is more focused on roadway design and bridge design and the traffic engineering um, team is something that reports to me, but it's not, it's not my direct responsibility anymore. Um, but during the really about the previous 30 years of my career, I did traffic engineering. So I did lots of capacity analysis and safety studies and quarter studies and, um, you know, travel demand forecasting and traffic simulation models, all of those types of things were kind of daily assignments for me. And I, you know, obviously I've, I've functioned more as a project manager in, in you know, the last 20, 20 years or so. But before that, I was very technically involved in the actual analysis and writing reports and giving lots of presentations. We interview for jobs all the time, competing for work. But one of the things that about six years into my career, I really wanted to experience was what's it like on the public agency side. And, and I kind of made the decision just sort of from my observations of working with different clients up to that point that, I, and I'm not saying any of this to sway your decision one way or the other, the other, because there's lots of good positions, but I wanted to go be a city traffic engineer. I, I wanted to sort of be the, the head person in an agency where I could be interacting with planning commission and interacting with city council and interacting with kind of the director level positions within the organization, as opposed to being, um, you know, just, just, just a roadway design engineer that was one of 20 or 30 or 40 people that might exist in the in a large DOT type of organization. So um, I kind of made that decision because I wanted to get that experience on the public agency side and, and I really enjoyed it. I ended up not staying there very long, primarily because another opportunity came along that swayed my decision to, to leave, but um, I, I really enjoyed that aspect of the work. Do you have a, right. a question? Actually, Mike, I think we're the time's up, so I'm gonna move you on to the next room. Thank okay. You. Well, thank you all for your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Uh, good, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Brian Easley, and I am the Chief Learning and Diversity Officer for the United States Department of Transportation. I also serve as the Associate Director for the Human Capital Planning and Solutions Division within the Office of the Secretary. It's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, I've got just a brief period of time to share with you, so I'm going to try to move through some things that I wanted to share and then hopefully have a couple of minutes to open up the questions. Uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation, whose mission is to promote safety uh, throughout the, the country, 
uh, with regard to transportation systems there. Um, we've got about currently 53,215 employees as of March right now. Uh, we have within our organization, we have 11 different what we call operating administrations. And these, uh, we call them OAs. These OAs are uh, Focus on different areas, maritime, uh, aviation, the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration within, is within DOT. Uh, that's where the, that's the largest entity by far. They represent about 80% of the population within DOT, followed by the Federal Highway Administration. Um, we have employees all over the nation uh, at this time. We are currently led by our secretary, um, Pete Budacek who is our new secretary. He just got installed a few weeks ago and we're really excited to have him on board. Uh, we have a lot of different exciting initiatives going on right now. Currently we have about roughly 10 uh, internship programs throughout the department, both external and internal to the agency. Uh, perhaps our premier program that falls under me is the, what we call the SIP program, the Secretarial Internship Program. That is a program designed for undergrad as well as graduate students coming in at a GS uh, four to seven uh, grade level. Uh, it's a three month learning experience. We collect applications for the summer. We just got through um, receiving applications for, for this next summer iteration where students will begin in June and finish in August. We also uh, have a spring iteration of the program from uh, approximately January that goes through till about uh, March, April or so. Uh, and so that's our premier program. We participate in several others. FAA has a minority serving institute uh, program as well that targets uh, minority students also. Uh, I will provide you with my email address. And if any of you would like, we have an internship catalog that we can share with you if you'd like, uh, as well as a um, presentation for students also that will give you additional information about uh, DOT. Uh, currently we have, uh, you can find just about any occupational group, but as far as STEM, we have engineering. Uh, it's probably one of our largest groups. We currently have about close to 6,000 engineers uh, within the department. We have IT. Right now, cybersecurity is really hot, not just within DOT, but across the government as far as opportunities. And we have our transportation safety specialists, which is probably our largest occupational group where we have about over 23,000 individuals. And that's where you find your air traffic uh, controllers in that, in that population. Uh, so currently right now we have, we offer uh, a mentoring program across the department that falls under me. We have coaching available for individuals who want to enhance their performance. Uh, right now we are targeting, we definitely need to have nothing against the fellows there, but we definitely need to are strengthening our women, female population within DOT. Uh, of the 50 some odd thousand, we have only about 26% of that population are women. And it's a bit deceiving when you're in headquarters here in, in DC because you walk around and you wouldn't know. But when you go out into the field and we have uh, satellite offices and, and field sites and regional offices all across the nation, the numbers begin to dwindle uh, quite a bit. So within our human capital operating plan, which is generating our human capital initiatives, we do, we are targeting uh, women, uh, Latinos as well, persons with disabilities and persons with targeted disabilities as well. But of course, all are welcome uh, to apply. Um, so you can reach me. My uh, email address is brian.easley at dot.gov, brian.easley at dot.gov. And I'd be happy to share with you some of those materials I mentioned, the internship catalog, as well as this, the slide deck that we put together. So uh, I learned from the last initiative that I took a little bit too long. So I just want to open it up for questions. If you have any questions for me about graduate school, about the Department of Transportation, um, just to put on graduate school is make sure you're doing it for the right reasons, especially if you're pursuing a, a doctoral degree.
Uh, make sure you are informed, find yourself a mentor. And as I said to the last group, if you're pursuing a doctorate just for the prestige or for the title, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. If you don't like research, if you don't enjoy being able to write analysis, et cetera, quantitative uh, as well as qualitative, then you're probably not gonna last too long. So, all right, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to try and answer. Um, can you talk a little bit more about, uh, oh, my name is Paige Hines. Uh, I go to Prairie View A&M University in a uh, civil engineering major. And mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, uh, what are some of the, um, uh, like some other, I guess, initiatives that you all are taking to increase uh, women's, um, women in the uh, DOT? Well, Paige, that's a great question. We're trying to connect and establish our, ourselves with professional associations, uh, women's engineering associations, let's say, uh, and trying to um, make sure they're aware of our internship programs, of our vacancy announcements, of our hiring fair events that we have. We have multiple what we call employee resource groups uh, page within, our, within DOT. And one of them is called FEW, Federally Employed Women. So FEW is becoming really engaged and um, the president of that chapter within DOT falls under me and she's our corporate recruitment manager. So we are looking to see what we can do to, again, strengthen our exposure, uh, connect with student associations, sororities, page across the, uh, across the nation there, uh, faculty members that have an awareness uh, and just trying to do whatever we can to promote Department of Transportation as a employer of choice. Does that help with your question? Yes, sir. Awesome, thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. Any other questions? I have a quick question. Um, when you said if you're if you're doing it for the oh sorry I'm, I'm Melinda I'm from New Mexico State University. Okay. Um, when you said if you're doing it for the prestige, um, if you're not really necessarily sure if you want to do research research because you're not knowledgeable enough on it. Um, so you initially start off at that. What, what are your recommendations from that point of view? If, if you don't have a strong interest in research, is, is that what your question is? Oh. Well, I, I just don't know if I have a strong, uh, um, you know, interest in it because I don't have that much knowledge around the topic. They don't really teach us, you know, during our undergraduate years much on doing research and stuff like that. Yeah, well, I, I would suggest to you do, do, do some research out there to find out. There are, if you look at the Carnegie Institute, there are three different levels of, of research institutions. And I didn't know this until after I got my doctorate, but you've got research one institutions and research two institutions. Generally speaking, they place more emphasis on research. Then you have at the third level, they used to be called research three uh, uh, institutions. They're now called, I believe, professional development institutions. Those are institutions where there's not as much emphasis on research and more so there's more emphasis on becoming a practitioner, Melinda. So I always wanna make sure people understand that a PhD is different than any other doctor. There are a lot of people that and the emphasis should be on research. So if you are trying to become a faculty member, if you have a, want to be known as a researcher, all I'm saying is that you'd want to make sure you graduate from a research one or research two institution. So I'm just sharing that knowledge. If your desire is to become a practitioner based, that's fine. I mean, you can do that with any type of PhD, but you may find that a professional development institution may serve you better if that makes sense. Because a lot of people get into it just so I can be called a doctor and, and what have you and the prestige, like I said earlier, and the status. And I think that's the wrong reason for pursuing, for securing a PhD. And particularly if it's a research emphasized program, they're probably not gonna last very long. And I've, I've seen that happen. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you so much. 
Okay, you're welcome. But, you know, make sure you're just doing it for the right reasons and find a school that's in a program that's a good fit for you. All right, thank you, Dr. Easley. I'm going to move you over to the next room. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. How's everybody Hello. doing? Good. Hello, Hi. how are you? My name is Andy Dam Kroger. I appreciate um, everyone for, for giving me an opportunity to come and speak a little bit with you uh, today. Um, I'm, I work for a company called Warner Enterprises. We're one of the largest transportation and logistics companies in the United States. We, uh, um, we work in what is about an $800 billion industry. And so the, the scale, uh, the complexity of our industry um, is really incredible. And, and what that does is it provides um, just a tremendous number of jobs, but also a, a tremendous number of different types of jobs. So I wanted to, I wanted to talk with you all a little bit about that today. Um, I've, had, I've had the privilege of working for Warner for over 18 years. Um, I graduated um, with a business degree, and yet I've found myself um, you know, most recently working in technology. We'll talk a little bit about that but also um, had the opportunity to do a number of operational jobs, a number of, of commercial and relationship oriented jobs. And so um, I, I wanna talk to you um, a little bit about that. You know, you, people see a trucking company and, and what do they often think of is what are the jobs that are available? Truck drivers, right? Which is obviously true. Um, we have a number of mechanical jobs too, but um, in 18 years, I've, I've only driven one of our trucks around the block. So I've, I've had the opportunity um, to make a career in this industry, even though driving isn't my skill set. And so, um, you know, what I would encourage you all to do is, is take inventory of what your passions and skills are. Um, and then, you know, we could help you find that opportunity that fits those passions and skills within um, the transportation and logistics space. If, you, if you're a relationship oriented person, um, we have a tremendous number of support roles that are supporting our shippers, um, our, our drivers, excuse me, our, our, our customers, our drivers, even our subcontractors that, that we give work out to. Um, every one of those needs a lifeline to Warner to help them do their jobs well. Um, if you're a numbers person, um, or public, we're two and a half billion dollar publicly traded company. There's a vast number of finance and, and accounting roles within, within Warner. Um, and if you're, um, more of a, an operationally minded person, if you think about, um, every day we come in with tens of thousands of requests from our customers to help them get their goods moved. And, and we have tens of thousands of drivers um, and subcontractors that come to Warner and rely upon Warner every day for work. And it's our job to, to keep everybody happy and to put that plan together um, in a way that um, delivers an excellent service product, but also supports our, our drivers and and our subcontractors and, and their ways of our, and their, their financial well-being. Um, and because we're a portfolio company and, and while most people are familiar with us as trucking, um, we also move freight by rail and air and water. And so each one of those modes um, has its own operational processes, its own operational nuances and technologies and, and skill sets. And so, um, just because you're an operator, as soon as you move from one area of the business to another, there's new complexity, there's new challenges, and there's new learning to be had. And I've had the opportunity to, to participate in a lot of those roles and really see how the business works. Um, and then lastly, um, I would talk to you uh, briefly about technology. Um, that's where I reside today in our information and technology services department. Um, we are responsible for delivering all the tech that runs our business and is also extended um, to a lot of the different uh, customers or stakeholders that are interacting with Warner. So, for example, um, 
you know, everything from our core operational systems that support the modes and the processes that I just mentioned, um, every, um, our core financial, our core human resources services, our core um, a CRM, right? Our, our relationship management systems, all of those are our responsibilities to deliver to the business and, and really establish a, a digital foundation for how we work. From there, we get to do the cool stuff, right? When we start to think about extending technology uh, to places like in the cab of our truck, um, providing mobile apps, providing telematics devices that help our drivers do their jobs um, efficiently and safely, um, extending technologies to our shippers to help them understand, you know, where are their shipments at, um, extending technology that helps them do business and buy and, and, and send us work more effectively. And, and likewise with our subcontractors, the other trucking companies that we hire to do work for us and the other uh, modes such as railroads um, that we do work with and how we subcontract that work seamlessly to, to them. But also then even though we've, we've outsourced um, some of the work, provide a, a seamless digital experience back to our shippers so they know what's happening with their goods while they're in transit. So um, there's a tremendous amount of, of demand for technology because it's a complex um, it's a complex operation. But also, you know, if, if you think about um, it all of a sudden between, um, you know, our, our shifting buying habits, uh, we're starting to expect the companies that we do business with as consumers to provide this very seamless digital um, experience when we do business with them. So much of the product that we buy is now arriving on our doorsteps and we wanna know when it's gonna be there and, and where it's at. Um, somebody has to be able to raise all that data um, and put it in front of the end consumer in a, in a seamless experience. And so, um, we spend a lot of time making sure that we're supporting our shippers and, and doing our part in making sure that the transportation and the delivery is part of their overall brand recognition and the overall part of the overall customer experience. I would also tell you that um, the, uh, the reality is, is that um, beyond just the digital, um, you know, final mile or, or curbside type of delivery experience that we all expect, expect now as consumers, um, we've seen in the last year the importance of transportation and logistics um, be when things don't go well. When you look at a year ago when we all went to the store and we couldn't find essential goods like food and toilet paper, um, some of those dislocations were caused by changes in supply and demand but many of them were also caused by logistics challenges that arose from, from those changes in supply and demand and where we were sourcing from or pro our plants that were shut down. And so um, people really, really recognize the importance of logistics. You know, I, there's been a lot of um, publicity recently about, you know, trying to distribute vaccines. How do you get shots in the arms of millions of people around the country? Well, you need logistics providers to help you uh, to help you do that. It's not just the healthcare provider that does it; it's the manufacturer, it's the transports that help get everything um, from where they're at to where they need to be. So, with that, we have about a minute or two. I want to I want to be quiet for a minute and um, give you all a, an opportunity to ask a question or two. Well, here's what I would encourage you to do is, is the next time that you go to the store, um, one of our customers, right? A Target, a Walmart, a Home Depot, a Dollar General, um, a Lowe's, wherever you shop, um, whatever you're buying, think about how did it get there? And when you think about how did it get there and all the hands and all the steps that it took, you'll start to understand the significance and the importance of companies that work in the transportation and logistics space. We really do provide a valuable service. Um, it's, a, it's tremendously important. And I think that importance was recognized when um, throughout the last year when, when things weren't in the right place at the right time. And so if you wanna, if you wanna play a hand in that and 
um, you know, have a job that you really feel is is critical to our nation's economy and to and helping people and and uh, doing something that's really really important that you can be prideful about. I would absolutely encourage you to look at the transportation and logistics space. All right, we have 20, 25 seconds left. So any quick questions? Okay, well, I thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity and coming to speak with everybody. Um, this has been a, a tremendous experience. If you have any more questions or, or have in, an interest in Warner or our industry at large, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.